All right, now I'll hand it over to the reverse engineering team. Thank you. DEFCON 26, thank you. <laughs> My name is John Tarani, and I am the producer and editor of the project that we are presenting, Reverse Engineering. Um, I've been working in entertainment for the past 15 years with a specialty in unscripted content. Um, we're going to tell you about a great project that we've been working on, a project about you. And we're going to tell you how you can get involved and help bring the project to completion. Because after all, it is about you. So right now, let me bring up the, well, let me introduce the producer and director of reverse engineering, Michael Lee Nuremberg. Thank you, John. Thank you, DEF CON 26, for having us uh, to give this presentation. Uh, some of you this weekend thought I might be a narc, which, um, it's not the case, I'm on your side. Uh, my partners and I suspect we find a receptive audience here, and so thank you again for having us. I'm at times a writer, filmmaker, and probably most known as a commercial artist in movies and TV. Uh, I directed a documentary on Hustler Magazine that came out four years ago, because my dad was the art director in the 70s and 80s. So if you're interested in watching, it's easy to find. Uh, the reason I'm speaking to you today is that four years ago we set out to make a documentary about the history of computer hacking. And to get this right it involves bringing it to you because this is what you do. Uh, John? Okay, I'd also like to introduce another producer. You might know him as Bill from Arnock, <laughs> Dave Buckwald. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. What's cooking, DEF CON? Uh, my, my true given name is Dave Buckwald, and I'm a hacker, and I'm a filmmaker, and a visual artist. And, uh, and dog willing, on the 13th, I'm going to be 23 years sober. This was movie magic. Water. Okay. Well, we... <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've been working on this project. Mike, how long have we been working on this for? Funny you should ask, John, four years. I started when I was gifted a copy of this book, Masters of Deception. It led me to Bruce Sterling's The Hacker Crackdown, Stephen Levy's ha Hackers, John Markoff's What the Dormouse Said, Phil Lapsley's Exploding the Phone, and a number of others that were landmark books of the, of the early years of this thing. So after doing the research, I found that there was no major docu documentary, much less a major docu-series on this subject. And so we found a wormhole in the culture and the lane was open. So after doing the research, we just started finding people and filming them. The first being John Perry Barlow, which in retrospect turned out to be quite prescient. I've always been in the tech like many of you. I came of age in the 90s and I was fascinated by the early web, but I really didn't get really into it till the beginning of consumer broadband in the early 2000s. At that point, hacking's infancy had just passed. Now, there are great documentaries about specific hacking moments. Uh, it turned out to be incredible resources for what we're doing. But after doing the research, we realized that there hasn't been a single film that speaks about this thing, the beginning of this thing, to the broader non-hacker world. And um, there's a lot of people who don't understand it, who are afraid of it, and, and it impacts their lives every day. Now, one of the things that made me want to be a part of the project was the connection to New York City. Now, um, upon meeting the hackers uh, that we were interviewing, like Dave, uh, most of them are New York based, and I'm a lifelong New Yorker. So while I was reading Masters of Deception, uh, yeah, while I was reading Masters of Deception, I, I was able to visualize a lot of the places that they were talking about. I knew uh, the, about the Green Acres Mall and the radio shack there where the kids would go to buy their computer parts and their modems and stuff. So. I was able to visualize a lot of the places because I had already been there. And upon meeting Dave and, you know, the other people that, that from MOD and Masters of Deception, Legion of Doom, I was able to really identify with them just because, you know, um, I've, I felt that, you know, I was like them and I would have been friends with them in school. So, you know, 
bringing Dave on as a producer for me was a no-brainer. And uh, it would have been hard to be friends with me in school because I was, wasn't at school that often. I was behind my computer uh, most of the time. And I'm here because in 1983, 1984, I got an Apple IIe and a little bit later a, a blazing Apple Cat, blazing fast Apple Cat modem. And I very soon after that discovered text files and Tap Magazine, BBS's later 2600 Magazine. And uh, I was the lead singer of a group called Legion of Doom until I was busted by the Secret Service in uh, the summer of 87. And uh, I got my first taste of working in the film industry as a uh, hacking consultant on a movie, Hackers, which is not a documentary. Um, many of you have probably seen this, uh, this wonderful piece. Uh, in, in the 90s, I was working as a computer security consultant with my old uh, hacking buddy, Fiber Optic, until the dot-com bubble burst. And I got sick of making money anyway, so I decided to become a film editor. And I've always observed that the more you know about any given subject, the more kind of media distortion there is, and the, you know, the public perception gets so skewed. And working on this film is kind of my way of giving back to the hacker community and really you know, presenting, you know, not just for a new generation of hackers, but for general audiences, a kind of true depiction of, uh, of what went on and what brought us uh, to where we are now in, in, in an entertaining and non-didactic way. So along with my two partners from the Hustler movie, John Tarani and um, Flynn Hunhausen, who couldn't be here tonight, we met Dave while tracking down members of uh, the early 90s, late 80s group uh, Legion of Doom. And it turned out he was also in Brooklyn like the rest of us and it made sense to join the team being a film editor so he understood what we were trying to do. And um, it turns out to be a damn good film producer, which is how we ended up here. That's what I told them. Um, I primarily do picture editing and producing, and I've always stayed close to my roots in the, the hacker world. I, I've been the uh, cover artist in residence for 2600 Magazine, doing all the covers since about 2001, and designing their t-shirts. And it's funny, I see so many people wearing t-shirts uh, here that I designed you know, behind my little computer, so that's, that's always cool. Uh, and uh, it, it's funny what kind of started as just like an impromptu uh, uh, interview in my boiler room has bloomed into this like Herculean task of trying to document hacker history. So I, I alluded to, we're going to show the, uh, the 20 minute clip, so <laughs> we, we alluded to this earlier, but there are, there are very few documentaries about the original hacker generations. Uh, currently there's a great many of them being made about contemporary hacking because it's much more um, sexy to, to film, but the, the, it's easier to do. The existing documentaries there are basic cable or homemade YouTube documentaries designed for other hackers, more or less. Some of them have been quite good. Uh, my personal favorite is Annalisa Savage's um, Unauthorized Access because it was the first and it captured these guys in the moment before the law closed in on them. Uh, there's also Emmanuel Goldstein's Freedom Downtime, which is about Kevin Mitnick and his, his case, and Jason Scott's ambitious eight-part documentary series on BBS boards. Um, so we're doing something different so we can entertain, like I mentioned earlier, the non-hacker community and pandering to the old school media sort of bullshit scare tactics um, by talking to people who are actually there. So John, you want to set up the scene? Sure. Um, right now we're going to show you guys a chunk of the movie now, all three of us had our hands in making this, and please remember, it is a work in progress. Right, the, it's important to note that none of the music has been cleared because it, it's only tempted in. You clear the, you, when you have the lawyers, you, you do the, the last step because it costs so much money. Uh, the sound and the color isn't mixed yet for the same reason. And we feel at this stage, it's only right that we share it with the hacker community so we can get your input, see so what we can, what else we could do with it, because it's big, it's gonna be three parts. Um, I can't, I have to watch it with you, because I'm tethered to the thing, I can't walk away, so. Which is terrifying. Uh, yeah, John? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, no one's gonna walk out, because it's, uh, it's edited really well, whoever edited it. So let's show it to you now. Meh, he's all right. But after we're done here, we're gonna explain what the three parts are, and we can't dim the lights, because, because it's, 
the, the rule. Pretend that you're in a movie theater right now. The ambiance, the chandelier. We take these down though. No, 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 not can't not do anything. Down. I don't know. All right, enjoy. Today, five hackers were indicted on federal wire fraud charges, and NBC's Gary Matsumoto found their leader in an unlikely setting. That's fiber optic with a PH, described by some as a computer genius, by others as a computer anarchist. When you're a little kid growing up, you kind of feel like you don't really have any control over what's going on. As far as what was going on in the news around us, in the 80s, the Soviet Union was still a very real thing. We were worried about nuclear war. Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev are negotiating this stuff, and you're hoping it turns out okay, but you really don't know from one day to the next if one day everybody's just going to blow up. This permeated culture. It was in movies, it was in music, and it was some scary shit. Getting online and sort of becoming part of this computer underground was something that we felt that we had control over in a world that we had really no place in. New York was nothing like how it is now. It was the crack epidemic of huge proportions. Drugs in the street, violence everywhere. So you have to be constantly aware and that sort of hyper-awareness translated into breaking into computers and out of that came a new class of people, hackers, young people that knew technology inside out, had grew up with it, and could see the networks that were evolving right before our eyes, and could see where it was going, and play with it, build around it, interrupt it. In some ways, the kind of curiosity that could only be generated inside of like a busy place like New York City. At the very beginning, it was about a shared interest in an illicit world of information. And initially, there were no barriers. This was a world that was free to afford. And subterranean and secret and accessible. At that particular time, the internet existed, but you know, most people weren't really on it unless you were at university or worked for one of the various agencies, you know, in the scientific or military. But there was a rise of like these online BBSs and these uh, networks. BBS stands for Bulletin Board System. And this was how people would communicate with other people that also had personal computers. Once a computer is equipped with a modem, it can both send and receive messages to and from any other computer in the world that is also equipped with a similar sort of modem. The first time that I telnetted another machine halfway across the country and realized that I was, I was connected to that computer way over there. It was a religious experience. A friend showed me this and he said, yeah, I'm calling up these bulletin board systems and you can do all these things with them. You would call a phone number, put it into a cradle, and then it would answer and you'd be able to talk to the computer. And then you end up with uh, a bunch of strings of characters and people's names, and I just thought this was insane. I thought this was the greatest thing ever. It was very, very slow. It would take days for messages to arrive sometimes. The kid whose parents had an extra phone line would leave his computer hooked up to the phone all the time so that you could call into that computer or someone who calls into some other computer far away and this computer called that one called that one. So it was a completely kind of ad hoc mesh of computers. You don't know where this is. You don't know how it's being done. And at the time, that's, that's beyond belief. The first one I got on was called Q-Link, which was the precursor to AOL. 
and I got on there and I didn't fit in at all. I'm like, yo, who here likes Biz Marquee? And they were like, yo, nobody likes black music. And I was like, oh man. And it was like, and I got like trolled by like a guy, his name was like NKOTV, like New Kids on the Block. And there's a whole bunch of posts about hacking and I'm like, holy shit, hacking, breaking into computers, sounds kind of cool. The computer underground in the 80s was the age of exploration. And that's in stark contrast to whatever semblance of an underground exists today. It's not about exploration. It's about theft. It's about bank fraud. It's about monetary gain, unfortunately. You're really into computers, huh? Yeah. What are you doing? Dialing into the school's computer. They change the password every couple of weeks, but I know where they write it down. One of the biggest films I think had a huge impact on me that came out in the early 80s was War Games, about a kid who's looking for a video game company. Uh, he's a hacker. A lot of the things they show in the movie are true to life as far as how he goes about looking for systems, scanning telephone exchanges for modems and so on. I can't tell you how many different hackers I've interviewed who said, I watched that film, I asked for a modem for Christmas. It was at that point that the word hackers, which nobody really knew in society, took on a new meaning. Hacker before had been someone at MIT AI who was a programmer and nobody ever saw them. And hacker after the war games was a kid, uh, you know, with acne who was about 15 who broke into computers. These bands of teenagers would begin exploring these things and they would do sometimes fun things, sometimes illicit things. All these bulletin board geeks were, <laughs> they were a funny bunch. They were basically just punkers and if somebody took their skateboards and gave them modems, it wouldn't make much difference. It was not unusual to find a system with a default login with no password, even on some relatively important systems. And, you know, is this wrong or right? It doesn't really enter your mind. You're really doing it more out of curiosity. I was a phone freak and a hacker. It's like I love telephones. So just a computer itself was too small. I, I liked networks, and there was no computer network as large as the PSTN, the public switch telephone network. The first modem I got was a family friend was like getting rid of an old 300 baud modem. That was pretty much the beginning of like my road to sort of you know being a hacker into what I do now. There's this big machine. How do you like you know get inside it and take it apart and play with it? And then also how do you use it to create mischief? Eventually I was able to like finagle an Apple Cat out of my parents. The Apple Cat could generate sound effects. So you could actually use it as a blue box and do all kinds of things with it that you couldn't do with an ordinary modem. That one was life changing because it was a very programmable modem. You could produce any tone that you wanted, including the control tones for uh, in band signaling on phone networks. You can basically take control, become an operator, and just do anything that you wanted. It's pretty magical when you're a kid and you suddenly realize, uh, hey, I can control the phone system. Growing up in San Antonio, Texas, there really weren't any other hackers there. The big scene in the early 80s was primarily uh, centered around New York, New Jersey. And so that's where I ended up gravitating and that's where I ended up meeting a bunch of like-minded people. There began to appear hacker groups which were loose affiliations of kids typically that never met each other. They didn't know each other's identity or any of that. They came up with an alias, a handle, and that's how they affiliated on these BBSs. I picked Eric Bloodaxe because I had read a really cool book about Vikings. It sounded cool, my first name's Eric. And so Eric Bloodaxe went from bulletin board to bulletin board around the United States. Now you have this knowledge base that's forming of systems, how to use them, and how to maintain access to them. It was those early BBSs that turned into what we refer to as the elite BBSs. Thirteen of us will form the most powerful and sinister group the world has ever seen. 
From now on, we'll be known as the Legion of Doom. Legion of Doom was a super group of hackers who were, let's say, at the very top of the game. I read about the Legion of Doom, and I said, like, fuck it, if these guys can do that, I can do that. And I basically went out and became the head of the Legion of Doom. And it was like a popularity contest. I had this kind of overview of the inner workings of AT&T better than maybe any one single employee. I would get off on being able to listen in on a phone call or prank pulling. Like, you know, you turn somebody's phone into a payphone. Somebody picks up the phone, dials the phone to make a phone call, and they get a recording telling them to deposit a quarter. Or taking a payphone and turning it into a home phone. That was what would help you gain uh, popularity. If somebody hacked you, you, you try to figure out a way how to hack them back. It was sort of a pranksterism. You know, we broke into a ton of shit. I mean, I broke into companies that, I, you know, you, you would just be, like, shocked at, like, the level of data that's stored. And there's a very, very strong ethos among hacker underground communities to keep quiet. If you're calling attention to yourself through these kind of audacious hacks and, and groups, guess who's going to come knocking? It was really hard to get in trouble unless you were just doing something really wrong or really misguided. That you were drawing unnecessary attention to yourself. People considered Legion of Doom to be sort of at the, the pinnacle of the computer underground. That didn't just end at the edge of the computer bulletin boards. People within the regional Bell operating companies knew who Legion of Doom was. People within the FBI and the Secret Service knew who the Legion of Doom was. People in, you know, corporate security for credit bureaus knew who Legion of Doom was. Law enforcement didn't really know how to deal with it, I think, at the time, because it was so new. There were laws going back to the 30s from telecommunications like wire fraud, the Wire Fraud Act, which could be considered most anything. There was in, I think it was around 1986, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which was largely untested. It certainly was never tested on anyone in the mid-80s. By the late 80s and early 90s, it was the thing that they were using uh, to prosecute uh, a lot of us. But they were really just trying to make a lot of noise to show the public and the government that they were doing something about the problem. It's a threat to big business. It's some kind of threat to infrastructure. And this is how to stop it, by kicking in doors and seizing computers. You know, they, they weren't that tech savvy, the Secret Service in those days. It seemed more like they just wanted to shut it down and make everyone stop doing what they were doing. So they came to my house in a UPS truck and uh, an assistant district attorney rang my doorbell and said he was from UPS and he asked my dad to sign the clipboard. Dad signed the clipboard. He says, where's the package? And he goes, bring in the package. The back of the van rolls up and you know, guys with sledgehammers and there were guys with guns drawn come out of the back of this UPS van They're taking computers and taking notebooks. They weren't trying to put anybody in jail. They were just basically trying to scare people into stopping. There was one guy I knew that said that when the FBI came to his parents' house to arrest him, they took all these, all of his computers, but left all these very important computer security books that had tons of information because they didn't actually know what they were. There was a kid, I think he was in Indiana, he got arrested for some kind of calling card fraud. They saw he was all involved in computers and they said, you're a computer hacker. Are you in Legion of Doom? He goes, no, but I know some people who are. And that ultimately led to uh, me being raided. Well, I don't think you have to be that smart to know that if you get raided by a three-letter agency and you never go to jail, you must have sung like a bird. Our top story at five, a massive offensive by the U.S. Secret Service against illegal computer hackers. Search warrants are going out here in Chicago and a dozen other cities coast to coast in an effort to stop computer fraud that is costing companies and consumers millions of dollars. When law enforcement really started making its presence known, busting into people's homes and, and seizing their, their computers, this affected um, a growing number of people that I knew. There were certain individuals who kind of thumbed their nose at the whole thing and kind of had a more uh, daring attitude 
uh, at a time when when uh, what modesty probably would have been better course of action. It was probably around that time that I had uh, a falling out with uh, with a particular uh, LOD member who, by de facto, uh, found himself in charge of the group. Trying to put together one of the Legion Dome technical journals, I had was trying to map out different um, packet switch networks to identify all the computers that existed on a particular network. I knew fiber optic had access to information about the internal setup of the X25 network used by 9X, which was the New York telephone company. And I was like, all right, well, can you give me a breakdown of what's on the, the 9X packet switch network so I can include it in the directory? And he said, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll get that to you. And he says, if I give you that, you need to give me this other thing. I was like, well, that's not mine to give. So then later on, Mark calls this other friend of ours, a guy named Bob, and he says, hey, Bob, Chris told me to call you and get the login for this system. He didn't have it handy, and I need it now because I'm trying to work on this thing, and he needs something from me. So if you just give me the login to this, this machine. So Mark got the account, ended up getting that account locked out. So now we lost our access to that system. So I found out about this later on, and I called everybody else in Legion of Doom, and I said, we need to kick this guy out. <laughs> so he hooked up with a bunch of his friends in New York and started another group called Masters of Deception. LOD was falling apart. People were getting, were getting busted by, by the government. Now a group that we had once respected, that I myself was affiliated with, was going off on a strange path that we didn't really agree with. MOD was supposed to be just a joke, playing off of LOD a little bit, but evidently there wasn't enough room for both of us on the networks of the world, and it erupted eventually into something called a great hacker war, where we start trying to hack each other, which was a lot of fun, but also caused a lot of trouble. From then on out, the deal was, let's get Goggins, let's get LOD. Great Hacker War was basically a, a disagreement between guys that I knew and one of the members of LOD who, um, let's just say, we thought was uh, engaging in some questionable behavior as far as potentially turning in other hackers. It wasn't really considered a war until the media turned this into a gang war in cyberspace, especially in the 80s. Gang violence was common. So, I mean, just writing off hacker groups as just the online version of, of violent gangs made it easier for law enforcement or people to, to visualize, oh, this is wrong, this is bad. We are experiencing a crime wave in the computer area that is just astronomical. We can't keep up. Nobody who's working in this field can keep up. This is not victimless crime. We are all victims. Well, the media needs to have a villain. And in something uh, involving computers or technology, it's very easy to label somebody who is smart and a bit mischievous as the villain because nobody's really going to be able to understand what it is they're doing. And they generate fear. The problem wasn't really ever identified. It was just sort of a, a speech that was repeated over and over again by prosecutors. Uh, and law enforcement, that there is some kind of hacker menace. It needs to be stopped by sending kids, teenagers, to jail. And for you, catch the man. Uh, I hope we caught you. Um, seems about the same amount of people, I think. That was better than I thought it would be. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so who wouldn't want to be a part of that? <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, it's... Where am I? Well, um, again, I'm glad that you, some of you stayed and um, interested enough to hear us out. We're doing the series in three parts because it's so big and we can't compress into the old 90-minute documentary format. 
So part one is about the origin story of computer hacking. Several concurrent trends were evolving to create the conditions that led to the personal computer. In this section, we meet the first generation of phone freaks, the corporations that created the personal computer, and the first hackers emerged from MIT and Stanford. The government developed the ARPANET. All these unique conditions were just right to develop the personal computer. John? Now, um, for those of us who were born after 1990, um, Dave, can you explain what phone freaking is? Yeah, uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit in the uh, clip we showed. The, 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 the phone network was the, the uh, you know, largest, vast, wide-ranging network in the world. And uh, you know, back then, and I try to tell this to my kids now, you know, phones didn't have cameras or apps or touch screens. And you know, Ma Bell was a cheap mother, but you could pick up your phone, you could make a couple of tones and be connected to anyone anywhere in the world, make somebody's, a bell ring in somebody's house at three in the morning on the other side of the world. And the hacker spirit was there, and I knew there was a lot going on beneath the surface. And uh, the trick was finding out about it. And there, you know, there wasn't Google, and there weren't BBSs that you could log on to, but there were technical journals and uh, internal manuals and reverse engineering that the uh, the early groups of uh, you know freaks learned to you know figure out this uh, network from the inside out. And uh, you know, part of the beauty of a lot of these early networks is security was an afterthought if it was there at all. And uh, it was kind of uncharted territory back then. And I remember uh, an old phone freak friend of mine told me, uh, and this is back when I was a little, little kid, um, that you used to be able to call into, they discovered you call into the White House and you get the switchboard operator and you politely get them to get off the phone with you and you just sit there and you're on like an empty line, there's no sound at all. And then a minute later you hear a click and the next inbound call coming into the president is connected to you. So as many of you know, um, hacking meant something different at first, and why this is very obvious to DEF CON attendees, it's not broadly known. And I mentioned a great many books on the origins of computer phone hacking, but there was a pranksterism that, that wasn't yet malicious. Um, but aside from freaking, there was a moment where big university computers were being installed in, in universities. As I mentioned earlier, much of the hacking movement can be traced back to 1960s MIT and Stanford's uh, AI lab. The, the grad students in electrical engineering became interested in these machines, which had the timeshare. They hacked to test the boundaries, which is where we get the term from. Um, they, they never would have predicted all the things you were doing. Now, much like the title reverse engineering suggests, we kind of have to work backwards as filmmakers. So we're always asking who came before them and who came before them. Right, the, the lore of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak creating Apple is a story we all know, but the culture that they emerged from is far undervalued and what is for our purposes what we're interested in exploring. So uh, part two is about the personal computer and the individual. Like the last section, several concurrent trends emerge at the same time. Electrical engineering students get jobs at places like Intel, Xerox PARC, IBM, Hewlett Packard. The Homebrew Computer Club and the People's Computer Company start up and computer hobbyists get together after hours to exchange information. Freakers too become interested. There's a race to invent the personal computer. This is well known. Bay Area's rock culture, psychedelic drugs, self-help gurus, and hippie scenes emerge with the NASA and Silicon Valley. Okay. And the, the third part of the series where you saw an excerpt from, uh, the, you know, we were thinking of as, you know, the war games and post-war games generation. And I mean, who thought at the time that this film would come out that would kind of motivate, uh, you know, a whole generation of teens and preteens to get into computers and go outfit their computers with modems? Right, in part three we concentrate on the kids who grew up with the modem and how that changed the world as you saw in the clip. Uh, personal computers make their way into the market and popular culture. Modems open up the early web and creating a population explosion. Teen hacker cultures emerge. Government closes in, law and arrest result and the internet goes mainstream. So Dave, yeah, can you tell us a story from when you were a little boy? Sure. 
When I was a teenager exploring other people's computer networks, it was a simpler time. And I remember my dad used to regale me with stories about uh, when he was a kid, they would go to the movies with 12 cents and they'd be able to take a trolley to the movies and have something to eat and go back home again. And he also used to tell me like 1200 baht is the fastest you're ever gonna get data to travel over a, a twisted copper pair. And uh, it was simpler times and times change. And you know, b back in the 80s, you would find uh, you know, systems that were wide open with default passwords or no passwords at all with documented source code and compilers on board. And, and uh, you know, we would backdoor these systems. So even if we were discovered, you know, by that point, you know, it was, you know, the point was moot. One of my favorite things we used to do is make it that if you would type P. Floyd at the login prompt, you'd be dropped down to a root shell. And, uh, you know, these things got backed up and, uh, you know, passed on to the, uh, the, you know, the upgrades of the, the systems as they went on. And, uh, you, know, uh, I, you know, one of the things that's important to really uh, keep in mind is, uh, you know, a sense of, uh, of history and how, uh, uh, you, know, you know, things like plastic whistles and punch cards will, you know, give way to, you know, teens depositing, uh, uh, source code on uh, open source, you know, GitHub repositories and landing these cush jobs at Google and Amazon by the time their peach fuzz is turning into a uh, neck beard. And how each, uh, you know, iteration of, of hackers gives into the next generation uh, until, you know, we wind up here today at DEF CON 26. Right, we're, we're almost done. Um, before we open the floor to questions, I'd like to make some, just a few points that, we recognize it's an international story, and because it's a medium with time-space limitations, we have to limit it to American hacking from the late 50s to the early 90s before it becomes mainstream. So it's pretty well covered by other people after a certain time frame. And so we haven't quite defined where to land it. Um, the, what was happening in the early 90s with Kevin Mitnick's story seems like a good place as any, but we're interested in maybe figuring out what really is the end of the first uh, generation of it. And it's a nonlinear story, so maybe you can help us figure out where the line is. So um, thanks for your time, and uh, yep. thanks for, thanks like for staying. Add. Yeah, I mean, just that, uh, you know, we need help, and, you know, insight is in, important, which is why we wanted to kind of bring this out to the hacker community now, you know, while we're still, uh, well, we're still in the process of, of, of uh, taping interviews. You know, we need help finding the kind of buried stories that, uh, you know, shape the, shape the world that have been forgotten and also find the, you know, the old timers before they become buried people and kind of find the, you know, the anonymous people who wouldn't give an interview 10 years ago and, uh, you know, the unsung heroes and even like the, you know, telco security dudes and prosecutors and, and feds that were around uh, in that time period uh, who helped uh, kind of shape uh, the, the perception and shape the, uh, the community. Uh, so before we take questions, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, we've got stickers on the table outside. Everybody grab a sticker on your way out. Um, most importantly, I, I, need to, I need to clarify this presentation, okay, although we are still looking for investment partners, we are looking for investment partners, this presentation was not about that, okay? That's not what this presentation was for. That's what the bar is for, <laughs> okay? So we're going to be here all weekend. Please come find us. So, uh... We'll also be at Snackus Maximus. And snack, we saw the the Snackus Maximus. So we're gonna we're gonna hit that too. So at one of the and the one pool of, party either a either pool party. karaoke. This karaoke tonight will be at that. Um, we will now open the floor to questions. Oh great! And there's no questions. You sir, glasses. Well, really, anybody. We we want to we want to 
put this into plain language that anybody can understand. Um, Mike and I are lay people. We are not, right? Is that the word? Yeah, I, yeah. We, we're we don't we don't we went to a couple of other talks to see what they're like, and the whole time we're like, Dave, what the fuck are they talking about? What is what 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 is this about? <laughs> oh, okay. There was a guy. There was a kid in here before. I just thought he was like wrestling with his pen. He kept like going like this with his pen, and I had no I I just I didn't know what I had no idea what his thing was about. So. So it, it's, we're going to try to put it into plain language that anybody can understand. Because it's fascinating, nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, from a cultural standpoint, it's, aside from the, the tech aspect of it, it's as a cultural phenomenon changed the way we live our lives. Anybody else? You, sir, also glasses and beard. How far are you along in the process? Well, um, we, were, we were talking about this earlier. Basically, we've done about uh, 19 or 20-some-odd 20, 20 interviews. But we've got about 100 interviews we want to do. We've so, got a lot of people who, who've come out and said that they, they want to be interviewed. And so, so there's other people we're seeking out, and there's other people that are, uh, have approached us. So it's just people are starting to find out about what we're doing. It's difficult with the, the whole multi-generational layer to it and like finding people that were active in this stuff in the, in the mid-60s you know, puts them in their, you know, some of them in their 80s now. Oh yeah, we got to get the dead people. You know, it's like we got to actually we got to dig up yeah. dead people to get them. Okay, you you sir over there. Hell yeah, we are. Yep, yep. Yes, yes. Do you we know can, him? No. We could oh, get. Him. I know okay. someone who knows. All right. him. Uh, yeah. All right. I don't think that's a hard one to get, but yes, definitely. Yes. Uh, you in the you in the center? I saw your hand go up. Oh, um, reverse engineering. This one? Yeah. <laughs> reverse engineering. It's, it's fine. Boom. Boom. Uh, <laughs> who, who else? Uh, who, anybody else got a question? Anybody got a suggestion? What didn't you like? What was not good about it? Oh, what you didn't really like? Criticism. Oh, you. Also, glasses. Back to you. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. This, the, I mean, the, the thing which is difficult about playing such a small, each, each of the parts that we talked about is going to be, a, 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 you know, if we're doing it as, as feature length, it, it's going to be running approximately an hour to an hour and a half and go in, you know, kind of drill down with that detail on the but different errors and the different things. And what we showed is n not to be construed as, a, a picture of what there was. It's just like it's a scene from a section, not a the entire section per se. We, which is why we want to do it in three parts because it's a massive story. I mean, it's not as simple as like like we were talking about the old documentary format, which was ninety minutes. Like the the Hustler movie that him and I did. When, when that came out, we were only able to get a major distributor because it was ninety minutes because it was the the package. And that was like four years ago. Now it's changed. Like everything is everything is series out. now. Yeah, I mean, Which is better. The streaming I mean, services better. and you Everyone know, wants a series. Looking, you know, talking, you know, HBO and Netflix and things along those lines. It, it allows for like longer form documentary series uh, to allow you to to cover the big picture. Yeah, you can stretch out more. Yeah. So uh, that was a compliment. Any more compliments? <laughs> <laughs> it was a compliment. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you, sir, in the blue shirt. Is it available online anywhere to view for other people? The clip is. We're still making it. Yeah. yeah. This, the, I want to talk to you, Tuck. I know about you. The, the, the sample scene that we showed is on our website, and there's also a, a short sales reel. It's like a you know, two-minute sizzle is the end we'll take, term, we'll take which I pass. hate. Um, but uh, th there's a short. Uh, Sizzle reel and as well as uh, the sample scene. Okay. So, oh. Um. 
Uh, find us at the bar. Well, we know well, him already. Know. That's our man. Wait, is, is yeah. that Steve? <laughs> oh yeah, that's Steve. That was good. Oh, what up, Steve? Thank you. So, I, so how do we reconcile what the the sort of modern? Well, no, it turned out somewhat dystopian. Right, it started out with all this utopian promise, especially you look at the stuff from the 60s at the dawn of the, you know, where like the psychedelic Bay Area and it all kind of comes together under this utopian shell. It did change everything. It may not be the way we, that the computer I, culture had wanted I, it to be. I think some of the u, u, utopia is a kind of a carrot on a stick. It's like always as, new technologies emerge, it's always like, oh, but, you know, you know, networking is going to save us, and the Internet of Things is going to save us, and, and it's, it's always something to strive for. Uh, and some of it is still quite utopian. Some of it, you know, it's not all terrible. Some of it's terrible, you know, no. like election hacking. But. Right, so we got, we got three. Uh, yeah. All right, you first. We'd love to. Yeah, it's just sure. hard enough finding the money for the original part, you know. But yeah, we'd love to. I mean, I'd love to do. Uh, I'd love to do twelve parts. You know, we're super ambitious. Yeah, there's no there's no shortage of source of source material. The, I yeah. mean, part of the the thing, uh, kind of, in the filmmaking standpoint, is like we want to have as much first first hand and first party uh, account as we possibly can. Of, you know, first person. Uh, interviews, and with the time frame that's going on, we're on the, the, the far end of the curve now, and we need to do, like we have John Perry Barlow, and we had sat down with him for four and a half hours. That's not possible today, and it's a shame, because it would be nice to go back to him after we talk to other people and say, well, you know, some of these other people said this, and you know, what, what else can you say about this to be in a different part, and it's not possible anymore. So, you know, it's especially when you're documenting the past, it's, that has to be given priority because it's fleeting, unfortunately. One, one more point on this is the last documentary I made with him, that the, the one on Hustler Magazine, there's five people in it who are dead, you know, which is, which, you know, the, the clock is always running. One of them even went to the electric chair. <laughs> well, lethal injection. Okay. But anyway. Uh, Guy from Mo were you were you at were you at Mohawk Con? Yeah. Yeah. Did you win? I think we're being know. given the time signal. Oh. Oh, sorry. I didn't got see the time signal. One minute. Okay. Mohawk, Guy, your last question. A little bit off topic, but what did you think about um, working on as an advisor and hackers at the time? Uh, what did I think at the time? Uh, it was it was pretty funny. I mean, it was uh, it was right after this uh, Esquire article. Uh, about hackers had come out and uh, with Michelle Pfeiffer on the cover of, of the issue and uh, um, and it, I mean it was Raphael who wrote the uh, screenplay uh, came to a lot of the 2600 meetings and knew a lot of kind of local New York people and tried to bring them in either personality wise or handle wise and then the whole thing got Hollywooded and uh, and then with a, a layer of British uh, directing of American events on top of it, it was fun. I mean, it, it, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I like filmmaking, so I enjoyed it on that level. But I mean, it's 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 storytelling, and it's it's fictional. I expected you all to dress like that. Can we can we take any more? Or are we. Yeah. Okay. Do we take one more or are we, are we good? Out of time. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so Def much. DEFCON 26. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah.